I'd like to welcome you to the 2022 annual meeting of the League of Women Voters of Los Altos Mountain View. Again, I'm Karen Bricker. I'm the president of the League. I will introduce our speaker, uh, Julie Yik Wong Koppel, and she will introduce students, Sri Harini and Chris. When we thought about a speaker for this year, we envisioned someone who would share a positive and inspirational message about youth and civic engagement. We face new challenges to democracy daily. We aren't giving up, but it is the, the youth who will build the future. We're excited about hearing from Julie and delighted that two students will join her. Julie's resume would fill the hour. So here is a brief summary. Her professional journey has taken her from California and Mexico to Puerto Rico with roles in both education and the nonprofit sector. Julie has an extensive background in curriculum design and teaching multilingual learners. She is passionate about working with teens and currently teaches at Mountain View High School, as well as serving as the district's ethnic studies curriculum task force chair. Julie has degrees from Harvard, Stanford, and San Francisco State. She recently completed doctoral research on high school ethnic studies. Please join me in welcoming Julie. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Thank you so much, Karen, for that kind introduction. I am really excited to be here with everybody today and appreciate the invitation from the League of Women Voters. I'm very honored to have this opportunity to speak with you. Also, as Karen mentioned, uh, given today's focus on youth civic engagement, I'm thrilled to have two very impressive student speakers who are joining us to share some of their thoughts on how young people are involved in participating in and strengthening our democracy. I've taught both of them in a course that I teach at Mountain View High School called Social Justice. And I would like to ask each of them to briefly introduce themselves and then they will be sharing their thoughts after my address. So first of all, Shri Harini, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. My name is Shri Harini. I'm a first year UC Davis student. Um, I'm currently double majoring in philosophy and English, two issues that I'm really involved with and find interest in involve resolving gun violence and also combating climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Sri Harini. And now Chris. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Chris. My pronouns are he, they, and I'm a junior at Mountain View High School. Um, and I think a major that I'm interested in going into is like sociology or um, possibly creative writing. Um, and then two major issues that I'm really passionate about um, is abortion, which I'll be talking about later, and racial justice. Great. Thank you so much, Chris and Sri Harini. And we will look forward to hearing from them shortly. At this time, I am going to share my screen for part of my address uh, just to kick things off. So in reflecting on the important topics of democracy and civic engagement, I have thought about the tagline for the Washington Post, democracy dies in darkness. Why does this tagline resonate? The past eight years have challenged our democracy, our rights and our society in fundamental ways, from threats against journalists to widespread gerrymandering to an armed insurrection at the Capitol. And of course, the ravages of the global COVID-19 pandemic. In addition to the catastrophic loss of life, we've also experienced the politicization of a public health crisis with devastating consequences. The phrase democracy dies in darkness implies that it is urgent to shine a light on what is happening in the world today, to actively engage and participate in our communities, to raise awareness, debate, discuss, march, protest, and act, to speak out to exercise our First Amendment rights, to get involved in developing solutions to the major challenges facing our communities. When we act, when we engage, when we participate, we are breathing life into our democracy. 
Now, given the magnitude of challenges facing the world, ranging from climate change to homelessness to voter suppression, it's understandable that some people feel overwhelmed and question what they can possibly do to make a difference. When people continually refer to the climate crisis as an existential threat to humanity, I can understand why some of us might feel like it's a problem that is too big to tackle. While there are a multitude of circumstances that threaten our democracy, this generation of young people that I have the privilege of teaching every day refuse to let democracy slumber. They refuse to let it wither away or die. On the contrary, this generation of young people, these high school and college students are noisy, opinionated, and full of energy and ideas. Trust me, as a high school teacher, I can tell you how much they love challenging adults. <laughs> this is usually positive <laughs> as they pose questions, challenge their peers and me to expand our thinking and push themselves to apply what they're learning in the, class, in the classroom to the world around them. In the class that I teach on social justice, students like Sriharini and Chris are investigating important topics like access to mental health, disability justice, human trafficking, and the Stop AAPI hate movement. And they're actively engaged in projects to raise awareness and combat these injustices. With this in mind, I would like to talk about three major issues, climate change, racial justice, and education. In the case of climate change, scientists tell us that we have a very limited amount of time to act in order to prevent catastrophic and irreversible damage to the environment. While the statistics and projections are dire and the daily reality of flooding, wildfires, and other effects of climate change are wreaking havoc on people in countries around the world, it is the young people who are demanding action. Sometimes their demands are loud and people immediately take notice. Other times those demands come from unexpected people and places, such as a slight 15 year old girl sitting outside of the Swedish parliament and people walk right by and don't even break their stride. But an inspiring part of this generation of young people is that when they care deeply about an issue, they are determined and persistent. In this case, 15-year-old Greta Thunberg continued to skip school on Fridays, protesting by herself in front of parliament to demand action on climate change. People began to pay attention and posted information on social media. And before you knew it, her lonely single person school strikes became the catalyst for a massive youth-led global movement for climate justice. It has grown exponentially into a global movement, sparking protests in over 125 countries. Teenagers from every continent of the world, over a million students protesting to demand action from politicians, business leaders, and elected officials to enact policies that will prevent further damage to the environment. These students are on the move and they refuse to back down. Take this off screen share. Okay, excellent. Now I can see um, all of you, which makes me very happy. <laughs> uh, so on the topic of racial justice, this is another area where students are on the move, demanding action, and they are determined to make change. In the face of the tragic killings of innocent Black people at the hands of police, the Black Lives Matter movement has galvanized the largest movement for racial justice oh, since the civil rights era. After the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and so many more, it has been inspiring to see the outpouring of public support for the Black Lives Matter movement. Protests that brought together millions of people of all backgrounds, Black, Asian, white, Latinx, indigenous, and multiracial were rising and gaining momentum across the entire country and beyond. In big cities like San Francisco, New York, and Chicago, people were marching and demanding changes to policing. And in small cities like Mountain View, Palo Alto, and Los Altos, students and other people were organizing protests and marches to raise awareness about police brutality and demand changes on a local level. 
As a teacher, one aspect of this movement that has inspired me is that students and educators have joined together in saying that the movement for Black Lives goes far beyond issues of policing and law enforcement. This is a movement for human rights. And to truly stand for human rights, you need to dedicate yourself to transforming society in terms of education. The movement to affirm the dignity, beauty, and humanity of Black people is rooted in education. So along with the protests against police violence, people supporting Black Lives Matter intensified their demands for the creation of ethnic studies classes. This created additional support and momentum on the statewide level across California to pass legislation, AB 101, that established an ethnic studies high school graduation requirement and to secure Governor Newsom's approval. On the local level in the Mountain View Los Altos School District, students, alum, staff, and community members began organizing and created a petition to demand the creation of an ethnic studies requirement for all ninth grade students. This led to a lengthy process of advocacy, attending numerous board meetings, mobilizing supporters, emailing, initiating meetings, fostering dialogue, and pushing for the creation of ethnic studies. The alumni and students led the way, leveraging their social media organizing skills, and they advocated consistently for the creation of this class. Ultimately, they succeeded in these efforts and the district will be offering ethnic studies for the first time in August of this upcoming academic year. It is no small feat. In the meantime, one of my takeaways from this experience is that when there are significant issues on a national level that are systemic and institutional, it can be difficult to determine how to best approach the situation and make a difference. In those circumstances, it is essential to think locally and push for specific changes in terms of laws, policies, or programs. Tackling systemic racism in policing, education, and all facets of society is massive, daunting, and important. From the push for ethnic studies across California and locally in the Mount Vila Altos district, we can see the value of proposing and pushing for changes that are local, specific, and relevant. Our young people are directly confronting problems and injustices in education, and they are boldly proposing solutions and taking actions to support the changes they believe in. As a teacher, it is such an incredible opportunity and responsibility to both teach and learn from young people. They are passionate, persistent, and determined to make the world a better place. Reflecting again on the Washington Post tagline, democracy dies in darkness. It is clear that young people are engaging in the world, shining a light on important issues and injustices and making their voices heard. Now it is up to people of all ages to engage in the collective process of strengthening our communities and our democracy as a whole. Thinking about the roles and relationships between older and younger people in social movements today, I would like to close with a quote and reflection from Alicia Garza, one of the founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. She said that for her, it is inspiring to see how older people are stepping up in service of the movement. She shared that there are older people dedicated to contributing to change and supporting young people saying, I'm not passing a torch, I am helping you light the fire. So it is with this idea in mind how do we collectively light that fire? How do we collectively shine light on the issues of the day and organize to strengthen our democracy? These are questions that I ask us to consider and bring into our later discussion this morning. And with that, I would like to turn it over to our two student panelists to share some of their thoughts on youth civic engagement. Thank you very, very much. And now I will turn it over to Sri Harini. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, last year, I worked with a student-led organization called Campus Change at Mountain View High School. We focused on removing school resource officers from campus due to the substandard experiences and discomfort reported by students. We also focused on curriculum change. 
particularly for the history and English classes at Mountain View High School in order to bring to light the experiences faced by varying students and also to introduce greater representation in the literature students were exposed to from grades nine to 12. We talked to professors, upperclassmen, and current students at the high school. And as we heard and shared our personal experiences, in addition to deliberating the impacts of our proposed actions, um, I really realized how this all led to really valuable discussions. And my, my engagement with this organization enabled me to recognize my role in the, in the community, as well as the value and impact that each person has in their community as an individual. It is crucial for more students to realize the power that they have as a person and also just collectively together as a community and a lot more. The, there are issues to which students can contribute significantly to. For instance, regarding gun violence, the younger generations have grown up practicing active shooter drills and their experiences and voices are incredibly important. I also believe that adults play a major role in how engaged students are in their community and in local elections. A lot of the students who I talked to unfortunately didn't vote for the primary elections and did not hear about the primary elections, but the students who did hear about the elections and did vote generally seemed to hear about the election from their parents or from their professors or through self-education by reading articles, watching the news, or just listening to a news podcast. This seems to emphasize the role that adults and technology play in voter education, specifically for younger generations. I also believe that civic engagement is different in high school versus in college. There seems to be more of a top-down approach to communication in college. For instance, regarding the strike that was organized by professors and lecturers in UC Davis during the fall quarter for better pay and also for greater job stability, I heard directly from professors and received emails from the university itself about these strikes. However, student-to-student -student communication at um, in college seem to be more disorganized given how divided students are, whether by major, interest, or year. However, when I attended high school, the student-led demonstrations were organized incredibly well, they, and they were inspiring and moving, and students participated from varying grade levels, and there weren't as many divisions, as, and there weren't as many students either. So the effort and call to action could be organized through a community effort. However, I also think that specific clubs and student organizations have an incredible impact in college regarding community work or working with the local government. While the intimate sense of community, profound emotion, powerful, inspiring speeches present in the high school demonstrations that I was exposed to seems to be lacking in terms of moving the entire student body to act. I think that it is important to encourage a sense of closeness, unity, and sincerity amongst teenagers and adults and forging harmony and compassion by sharing experiences which drive action and civic engagement. I believe that students can also be inspired to take action and engage with their community by being exposed to varying perspectives. Furthermore, just being able to hear matters directly from the individuals and communities impacted by varying issues is significant and immensely meaningful. There are cases and scenes that personally resonate with me and inspire me to take action and engage in elections. And I think that it is incredibly important for students to find something that inspires them as well. Something, whether it's from literature or film or documentaries or music or anything else that motivates them to take action and to engage with their community where they as an individual have an impact and can make a difference. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Riharini, for sharing those reflections and insights about um, your experiences as a student. And with that, we will go over to Chris. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Um, again, thank you to the League of Women Voters for hosting this and Dr. Yik for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to speak. <clears throat> um, I wanted to speak about something that I think is currently on a lot of our minds. Um, which is the Supreme Court leaked draft about overturning Roe. And I think that a lot of us must be feeling really anxious for the decision to come out soon. Uh, but I really wanted to emphasize that we have a great potential for protecting abortion. And so with my experience for it, when I heard that um, the leaked draft came out, initially I was really shocked and it took me some time to wrap my head around the fact that this was even happening, that Roe was in danger. 
And I think once I came around to the fact that that was true, it was really terrifying to hear that abortion could be stripped as a basic right. And once I realized that, I think it was the fact that this was a huge danger that extended beyond reproductive rights. And I knew that my school and that students around the country were going to have to mobilize. And so what happened is that I reached out to a couple of friends and built a team of co-organizers. And so on May 26th, uh, we organized a walkout that happened across three schools. I'm from Mountain View High School, and then there was Los Altos High School and Gunn High School. Um, and then we organized a march and rally as well during lunch. And the purpose of this was really to sound the alarms about the true danger that this presented. And through the walkout, we really wanted to make this statement that this is something that students are angry about, they're scared about, and that they're prioritizing. And this was something that we saw was definitely worthy of disrupting peace and school as usual. And so as a result, we had approximately 300 people show up to the walkout at Mountain View High School. And, but what was truly inspiring to me was that during our open mic, we had around eight people who just spontaneously decided to speak up. And I think that was what was truly inspiring to me. Um, and so I have a short video clip that we can play right now of what the walkout kind of looked like. Thank you, Dr. Yang. Yeah, and um, after it being around like two weeks since then, I think I've, after having reflected, what I really wanted students to understand was that what we did was not that special and that they were fully capable of doing the same thing and doing even greater things. Um, and often I think that the question that I and so many of us here probably struggle with is how can we get other people motivated? And as I was thinking about this, I got to the point of thinking, is it that people just don't care enough? Um, but after thinking about it, I came to the realization that inaction stems from ignorance. I think that when it comes to abortion, people have a lack of understanding around the true danger because this is not, like I said before, just reproductive rights, but it's a precedent to more attacks coming that could possibly infringe on the rights of trans youth. And even just with abortion in itself, we're talking about the livelihood and the freedom of half of humanity. And what I mean by getting active is that we should be mobilizing and getting in the streets through protests and rallies and marches. And often I think that the true power of protests are undermined because sometimes people think, well, how much change really comes from 100 people protesting? But it's not just about how many people participate in the protest, but it's about how many people saw that. Um, and just by that, the impact of it increases tenfold. And once people get in the booths and they vote, those protests are what they're going to remember. They're gonna remember that people were angry about this and that this is a true desire of a large section of humanity and of society. Um, and so the impact of protests are so much larger than we give it credit for. And to me, this is really a reminder that there's so much more to be done before November, before we vote before the elections, um, that there's so much possibility and opportunity for us to really rise up as society to show that abortion must be protected. Um, and just as a closing, um, a reminder that with every moment of inaction, our potential for protecting abortion shrinks, but with every moment of action, our potential for the liberation of women grows immensely. Thank you guys. Thank you so much, Chris, for sharing those reflections. And um, before I turn it back over to Karen and Lisa, I just wanna echo, uh, that you know the walkout that Chris and some of their peers organized was truly inspiring. 
I could see it outside the window, hundreds of students gathering. And uh, you had the opportunity right now to hear some of Chris's reflections. Uh, it was remarkable to me when I walked up and saw Chris with the bullhorn giving this just impassioned speech um, from the heart and based on knowledge and research and to see their peers as well stepping up. It was extremely inspiring and I think speaks to um, these issues that I know people in the League of Women Voters care deeply about as well. Um, so thank you, Chris, and thank you, Sri Harini. Well, thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Sri Harini, and thank you, Chris. And we have more time with you, I'm very happy to say. And when I envisioned this, um, you've brought it to life for me. So thank you so much. It's exciting. <laughs> so at this time, we are going to have a short, a short brainstorming session, about six minutes. Um, and Lisa will explain the breakout room process. Thank you, Karen. So we're gonna send you all into five or each of you into a, one of five breakout rooms. You don't have to do anything. It should magically happen. Your room will have six to seven people and a facilitator who will lead you in a discussion about the two questions. And those questions are one, what will encourage and inspire students to get involved in their community? Two, how can we get teens and adults to work together collaboratively to improve our communities? Okay, so, okay, so Julie yeah. is okay. going to lead the reports from the different rooms and share hers, I think. Okay, thanks. Um, yes, I'm getting flashbacks of a year of distance learning, teaching, and you know, <laughs> zooming back in breakout rooms. So uh, <laughs> appreciate everyone rolling with that. Um, so uh, yeah, we'd love to hear briefly from um, each group, and maybe we could keep it to about a minute of the summary because we definitely want time for sort of an organic like Q and A after that. Um, <clears throat> uh, but could we have the uh, the facilitator from Group One, uh, breakout room one, please uh, share? That's you. That would be oh. like, I got delegated. I got oh. delegated. You did, Karen. No, Sue. Sue. No, Julie, you're number one. Oh, you're we're the... number one. Okay, I didn't realize that. Um, that so, Sue, would you please okay, care for our group, actually? You asked me to do it. Is you, Sue, want me to do that? Yes, please. Okay, will do. All right, so we took the question of, of getting uh, young people and adults to work together collaboratively to um, to you know to uh, on on issues that would bring um, the two groups together and sort of um, perhaps make more of a difference than just one group or the other um, so we talked about it both ways um, I think it was um, Shahini um, Shahirini said that the people who have, the adults that have the most influence on students are the professors and teachers. And they're a good conduit to the students to let them know um, what issues are and, and how they can go about uh, making change. Cynthia suggested that we try doing the, um, from the bottom up and see, uh, because Chris had talked earlier about abortion and said, what if adults said, okay, this is something we can get behind too. So how can we help you? So those, um, those were a couple of the ideas. I, I have to say, um, thought that I want, I touted the uh, Gary Hedden um, uh, projects that plant trees or um, take bike rides to improve the environment. Activities that can be enjoyed and um, by both adults and young people so that there's no, there's not this awkwardness of we're young people at this, um, you know, uh, rotary meeting, or we're uh, grown-ups going into the high schools and we feel out of place. So, um, a shout out for projects that that can involve different age groups very comfortably. Thank you, Sue, for sharing. And can we go over to Karen, please, to summarize <laughs> the room too? Yes, and we were so efficient. We did it in about half a minute <laughs> with our little technical problems, but you know what, we're flexible. Um, so the, uh, what Lisa had said, get into the same room with kids. I mean, that's really the, 
uh, with young people. That is really the thing. It's not talking at them, uh, being in person, face to face. We see each other as people. That's great. And Carol Donahue mentioned um, going to youth advisory boards on behalf of the league, seeking an opportunity to interact with kids, not to preach at them, but to learn from them. And I think that's always the attitude we should have. And I thought about clubs that Mountain View and Los Altos and uh, approaching them to see if we could come in and, and talk and possibly, you know, close to the election would be a good thing to remind people to vote too. Okay, so that's us. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, and Sarah, will you please share next? Okay, unmuted. Um, okay, so quickly, um, we talked briefly that when we were going, uh, the league was going into the high schools at least uh, to pre-registered 16 and older students for voting, that that was one um, effort to try to engage them. And as part of that, when we were meeting in person and it was not really an option under Zoom, um, was to have them visualize by, so the turnout for this primary was 26% roughly in California, that it have 26%, 25% of the class stand up and say to the other 75%, is this what you want? You want this number of people representing you. There's 75% of you who are not, not part of this. So um, the whole notion of visualization of what, what this really means. Um, uh, the notion of peers, um, seeing peers in action gets other students to participate because it's role modeling for them, um, trying to help students understand the gravity of issues, um, for adults to learn the social media, the TV shows, what, what are youth um, engaged in, um, uh, looking to for information. Um, Let's see, um, trying to find issues that um, people of all ages are passionate about and how it affects us on an individual level rather than just in the broad scope, let's say climate change, we can all react to, but we can personalize it, you know, bring it down to a more individual thing. And then um, today, as an example, there's a March at five that students are organizing regarding gun control. It's in Mountain View. Adults, get your bodies out there and join these students. Um, um, and be grateful for their organization. Yeah. So there you go. Thank you, Sarah. It's a wonderful range of ideas. Uh, and now from room four, Abby, could you please share? Yes, that is actually, thank you, Sarah. That's a wonderful segue into our group's discussion as well. Um, so we talked a lot about finding things that students like to do and engaging them in those areas. Um, and then once you get them engaged, how like you can really help them see the impact that they can make. Um, one group member mentioned creating a liaison between the high school community and other like community groups so that groups are aware of stuff that's happening, like the march that Sarah mentioned, um, so that they can not only have an ongoing dialogue, but so they can participate in, in student-led activities, as well as inviting students to participate in the activities that other organizations are having. Um, and then they, we talked about like sort of um, making connections in the student community and having a good awareness of where they're at developmentally, like different activities and different things might be appropriate with different age groups. We've been focused on obviously older youth, but there could longer term or at other times be stuff with younger students and they would have different needs. Um, and then the other thing that got mentioned that I thought was really good to think about was succession planning. So obviously students eventually age out, they go away to college, they do other things. So thinking about how you sort of build structures to continue that engagement, um, given that those students are there for a set amount of time. Um, and then how uh, one, one person mentioned how engaging students now helps them and makes them more likely to continue that work as an adult. Um, so kind of like the impact of engaging them on some of these critical topics that that might have long-term impact and not long-term engagement either with your organization or other similar organizations because they get really passionate. Um, Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Abby. And now, um, Pete, would you please share from group, group five? Sure. Um, we focused primarily on what it means to get involved uh, in the communities 
Um, and in addition to uh, what the uh, two student speakers spoke about earlier, um, which are ways of raising awareness and educating, uh, we identified um, three general categories. One is um, formal channels for students to get involved. Uh, for example, the City of Mountain View has a youth advisory committee uh, and uh, there's a council youth services committee that works with uh, the youth advisory committee and there are additional boards that teens are eligible to participate in, uh, such as public safety. Um, there's also an internship program. Oh, I, I apologize if you're getting any uh, interference. There's a, actually a string quartet playing next door here. Um, so, um, so those are formal channels. Uh, students are also uh, elig uh, eligible. They're encouraged to use informal channels. They can volunteer for a political campaign. Um, they can uh, be advocates for local issues that are before uh, local education boards of trustees and uh, city councils. Um, and uh, then there is what league can do to act as a catalyst for these sorts of things. Um, and uh, there was an idea put forward to um, work more closely with community colleges and allied organizations uh, to organize rallies for such issues as getting out the vote um, and uh, that was what we were able to do in six minutes. Wonderful, thank you, Pete. All of those are such wonderful ideas. Uh, and I think um, Karen or Lisa, you were going to now kind of transition us into the Q and A, right? Yes, <laughs> and you can all hear me, right? Yes. Um, yes, so we actually have, this has been wonderful. Um, I'm so, I love all the ideas that we heard. We have about, eight minutes until we need to stop uh, this part of the program in order to go into our business meeting, which probably won't be quite as exciting. Um, so I'd love questions from the audience. And you can use the again, use the raise hand feature, which is in reactions. And so any questions that you have for the students for Julie? Um, Sarah, and then Eleanor. Um, I just wanted to um, mention two thoughts that, uh, one that I just thought of and one I didn't uh, forgot to mention. Um, you know, we can guess a lot either as students or as adults about what other people are thinking, but I think there's a real benefit to doing some really short, really thoughtful, really well-written um, questionnaires to like after this rally at Mountain View, what, did you participate, yes or no? Why did you participate? Give them some options, give them a free answer option. If you didn't participate, why not? You know, let's, I think we need to get a better understanding um, instead of guessing. Um, and then related to that, we rely a lot on students to find the opportunities for themselves on the different, you know, youth advisory, this, that, and the other. And I'm wondering, um, are there representatives from the city council going to the high school, going into a classroom, or people from the school board actively engaging um, either, either a broader presentation or specifically in a civics classroom to uh, bring it there? Mm -hmm. So those are my two, not questions, but comments. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Eleanor. You have a question. Yes, then, good morning. Yeah, my question uh, for Julie would be, um, uh, <laughs> do you see the implementation of ethnic studies as an impetus or um, a tool uh, that can lead to more student involvement in civic activities? <laughs> yes, uh, I do. <laughs> and uh, Actually, it's it's wonderful that you're bringing that up um, in the Mountain View Los Altos district, and I think in many school districts around the Bay Area, um, integrating and uh, you know having opportunities for youth to specifically get involved in, say, city government or the school boards or um, outside organizations is something that we're really really hoping to do. 
And so I think teachers um, really could benefit from that direct outreach from the league. You know, so some of the ideas you're mentioning, you know, uh, being in touch with social studies department coordinators, civics teachers, I think would be really, really terrific because ethnic studies is a unique class um, that is focused on getting students involved kind of above and beyond um, some of our more traditional history classes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Gary, you had a question and then Pete and then Sue. <laughs> and then I think we may be out of time. So um, I, I'm involved with the, the students quite a bit. You see my virtual background. I've got uh, some students from the high school green team going with me on the winter or summer solstice night bike ride. Our biggest challenge, I think, is, is getting the word out and, and, and finding so people know what we're doing, students and adults. So the question is, what's how do you you uh, the two students here, Julie, how, how, how do you find out about things? Then? We send emails, we have our personal contacts, we try to use social media, but what works for you? Chris, what would you say? Um, in terms of like reaching out to students and getting in contact. How do you learn about things? Um, I think that my go-to would be social media. Um, I think that that's kind of obvious, especially for students, because naturally we spend time on those apps. Um, but I think what, what's... It's not just Facebook, it's something else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say uh, news-wise, Instagram is very helpful. I quite never use see those things on Facebook. Um, yeah, things like TikTok and um, Instagram. And I think the reason why is because these apps, I don't think it's necessarily the news channels on, on these apps that are providing the information that most reaches the kids. I think it's um, just individual creators that are around my age or a little older who are always providing like a different perspective on what's happening, always like kind of, they're very critical um, about the issues that, and that kind of stuff doesn't really make the news. And so I would say that. Oh, that's good. So for us, since we don't have those immediate connections, we really need to find somebody to, to channel for us and get it out to the, to the different groups. Okay, I think we have so little time. I want to go to Pete and then to Sue briefly. <laughs> okay, quick question for Dr. Yick. Um, voting, as we were reminded last week, is hard. The ballot is huge. It's got all kinds of things on it that you weren't expecting. In November, our ballot will even have a whole bunch of ballot propositions. Um, is the current curriculum for high school students enough to prepare them? Uh, and if not, where are the gaps? And what can league do to help fill those gaps? I think that one of the gaps is the actual like practical um, aspects of voting. And like more specifically, you know, in the civics curriculum, students learn about, you know, how government works and whatnot. Um, but I can remember a few years back, a student who cares deeply about issues, who really wanted to vote, and then was like totally flummoxed and overwhelmed by the ballot itself. You know, and I don't think the civics teachers necessarily take the time to like, like if the league could provide, you know, old ballots or like sample ones and go through lessons of like, this is kind of how you do the research. This is literally what it looks like when you fill it out and when you drop it off. A lot of times students, like they've never used mail, like like the concept of a stamp or something like mail is like completely foreign. Um, so like if there was sort of the toolkit of the league um, or other groups or the teacher saying like, this is literally how you do it. This is what it looks like, you know, um, and then this is how you drop it off or these are the places you go to. Um, I honestly think that would be very helpful. Okay, yeah. Thank you. And we're already on the path to being able to do that. <laughs> okay, Sue, you had a question or are we going to, did you have a question? I did, but I, I since it, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll give up. Okay. <laughs> well, I just want to thank you, Julie 
uh, you know, we started out with sort of this amorphous idea about what to do, and it's just come together so beautifully. And Sri Harini and Chris, you've really made it special for you to be here. You've added so much to the program. I just want to thank you. And I had offered Julie an honorarium to donate to a favorite charity. And when we talked about it, she said, I just wanted to go to the league because you're so important. And I just want to thank you, Julie, for those thoughts, for what a, what a great job you did. So please, let's all virtually thank <laughs> our guests this morning. Thank you so much. And then we're going to move on to the business meeting. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everybody, for, for having us. We really appreciate it. And thank you, Sri Harini and Chris, as well.